Steve, it looks like we're overlooking uh, a lake down there, but it's not like any lake I've ever seen. What, what has happened here? Uh, this is Spirit Lake, uh, north of the volcano. At 8.32 in the morning on May 18, 1980, a giant earthquake occurred under the mountain, dislodging the north slope, and the, the mountain collapsed into the lake. So the and debris from the mountain came into the lake? Came into the lake and deposited on the bottom of the lake about 200 feet of deposit. Simultaneously, it pushed the water of the lake up onto the north slope here. And we see on the north shore and the slope this uh, gigantic scour deposit. So the landslide debris lands in the lake, pushes the water up 860 mm. feet above the pre-eruption level. There is scour on the slopes of Mount Margaret. And then it went around in a circle in this basin right here and created this uh, kind of scour vortex. And that scour vortex is what brought all that timber down into the lake? Yeah, so the, 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 the logs that are in the lake were growing up on this slope. So we had a forest here before the explosion? Yes. Uh, over here in the blowdown area, the trees were just blown over. But in the scour zone, the water scour zone, they were actually ripped loose from the surface and they landed back in the lake. That gives you an amazing picture of the power of water. Yes, the water, the power of water to erode a landscape is right here. Uh, we can see grooves and furrows, and you, you can actually see the vortex where the water went around in a circle to make the, this basin in front of us. If it can do it here, could it do it on a larger scale, like on a global flood? What would it do? Uh, water is able to sculpt and, and uh, bevel rock mm. with ease, and that, uh, that's, that's what we see here, and that's what we can imagine on a larger scale yeah. during a global flood. So what we see here is just a, a small part of what massive water can do compared to what would have happened in a, in a huge global tsunami. Yes, and this is a scale model, a little living laboratory for the study of catastrophic erosion of bedrock. Uh-huh. Uh, Steve, these logs have been floating for, what, about 35 years, yeah. right? What have you seen over those 35 years in terms of those logs and how they float and the action of all of them? Uh, the logs, of course, float, most of the logs float horizontal, prone on the surface of the lake, and then they sink. But we've been trying to watch how they sink to the bottom. Half of the logs have been redeposited, and so what we discovered is they float upright at the surface. The root end of the log usually gets soaked with water, becomes heavy, and sinks, but they float in upright position. Then we noticed that they fall and disappear, and they stand upright on the bottom of the lake. When I did my diving uh, in the bottom, at the bottom of the lake, discovered large logs with root mass flaring out at the bottom of the lake, just standing there as if the tree grew there in the mm. bottom of the lake, but it didn't. It grew on the slopes up here. The log was ripped loose by the water wave. It, it, it uh, floated on the lake a little while, probably prone, and then went vertical, and then finally fell to the bottom and replanted in the bottom of the lake. We did a sonar study of the bottom of the lake. So we had sonar contacts with hundreds of upright logs on the bottom of the lake. There's evidence if we extrapolated the bottom of the lake, maybe there were 10,000 logs standing mm -hmm. vertical. What would Spirit Lake look like if you drained it? It would look like a, yeah. a forest that grew there. Mm -hmm. But no, it didn't, didn't grow there. It's been replanted. Uh -huh. And the implications of that are enormous. Steve, do these logs sink at the same time or at different, different times? We've been watching the log mat here for 35 years, but we've discovered that all the different species of forest logs do not float with the same duration. The first logs to be deposited were the noble fir and the silver fir. And we noticed that they didn't survive very long in the floating log mat. But the Douglas fir, they continued to float, and they're the resin impregnated logs that are today on the surface of the lake. Almost 100% of the logs, now half a million logs that are floating there are the remaining Douglas fir logs. The other logs have fallen, and the Douglas fir start falling out. So if you think about the bottom of the lake, there's a whole bunch of standing uh, redeposited trees, 
and they've been deposited in uh, species stratified uh, layers. Over time. Over time, over mm -hmm. the years. So, Steve, we have these trees that are sinking at various times, sediment layers laying up. And different types of trees and, sinking and at different, different yeah. uh, times, uh -huh. okay? So, let's say three or four or five hundred years from now, Spirit Lake is gone and someone is trying to analyze what happened here, what would it look like? It might look like a series of forests that uh, grew one on top of another. Uh -huh. Uh, isn't, isn't that the natural way to think? Here's the forest growing here today. There's the ancient forest that grew there on the flat land uh, thousands of years ago. You know, that, that, that would come naturally, mm -hmm. wouldn't it, if we, if we saw that. And seeing a species stratified deposit on the bottom of the lake, uh, yeah, that would imagine uh, climate change and an ecological uh, succession of forests, mm -hmm. something like that. And that sounds a lot to me, like what I used to see in Yellowstone Park, uh, Specimen yeah. Ridge. Now at the Yellowstone National Park at Specimen Ridge, there's a sign, or it was a sign, that talked about the petrified forests. And there's 27 different layer levels superimposed on one another. Each one of those was thought to be an independent or a succession of forests, one on another. Mm -hmm. And the study of the log mat here at Spirit Lake has helped understand the layers buried in mud flows there at, um, at Yellowstone and uh, the very beautifully petrified sequoia trees that are standing upright don't have uh, radiating root mass. Mm -hmm. They're not sitting on soil. Uh, there's all kinds of interesting tree ring correlations between logs with root ends at different levels, arguing that the the trees all grew at one time and were buried in the successive layers. So, so that reminds us almost yeah. immediately. So what we see at Specimen Ridge in Yellowstone that uh, has for years and years been um, viewed as a long succession of different forces is very similar to what we're seeing here. Yes, and so Mount St. Helens provides a laboratory for studying mm -hmm how species stratified logs get buried yeah. and, and could be petrified, uh -huh. like at Yellowstone. Yeah. So, so Mount St. Helens has enormous applications to uh, geology elsewhere, like at, like at Yellowstone yeah. Petrified Forest. Well, I'd like to get a closer look at that log mat. Can we go down there and see them? Yeah, we have a trail down there, and <laughs> it's, it's a really good way to go. All right. It's even more impressive when we get down here. All of these logs, they're just incredible. A million logs floated on Spirit Lake the day after May 18th. The, the lake was covered with logs. They thought the lake was gone. It looks like a beach, doesn't yeah, it? It does. But it's logs floating yeah. over deep yeah. water. You know, the thing that I guess I first noticed when I got down here is how these things appear to be almost milled. I mean, they're rounded, they're smooth. What, what causes all of that? They floated uh, for years now, 35 years, these logs have been floating in this lake. And they uh, rub against one another and they're milled. Obviously, the, the, the big observation to make here is the bark is mm -hmm. gone mm -hmm. after 35 years. Mm -hmm. And why don't we see, I mean, all this bark has been stripped off and these logs have been milled. Why don't we see all of that residue floating? It's uh, obviously waterlogged and soaked. Uh -huh. In 1979, I defended my PhD dissertation on the floating mat model for the origin of coal at Penn State University. What I was interested in was how a coal bed in Kentucky formed. And as I studied the coal bed, it became evident to me that it did not grow in place in a swamp, but that the coal bed formed from logs rubbing and making uh, bark, bark falling to the bottom and accumulating sheets of tree bark underneath a floating log bed. That was the model that I defended for my PhD dissertation. And that was before all this happened. Uh, ten months before Mount St. Helens exploded, I defended my PhD <laughs> dissertation on the floating log mat model for the origin of a coal bed in Kentucky. And then, and all then of a what happened? You had one here. And right here in my favorite volcano at Mount St. Helens uh -huh. in Washington State, we have a floating log mat for study. 
now it became a concrete reality. So I had to go diving and I had to go explore this log mat in this unusual environment. So are you telling me you've been down to the bottom of Spirit Lake? I'm trained scientific diver and I've <laughs> done uh, the, the dives to the bottom of the lake, up to 100 feet. And what uh, did you find there? I'm looking, looking at the, the bottom of the lake to see what the sediment is like that's mm -hmm. accumulated there since 1980. Well, yeah, it's, it, as you might imagine, it's abundant sheets of tree bark. That's where the logs deposited their bark, is on the mm -hmm. bottom of the lake. The water-soaked exterior of the tree rubs against another tree and is peeled off. Water-soaked, it swells, it sinks to the bottom, and you build up this thick, spongy layer of plant material called peat, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, it's formed underneath the floating log mat. Was it a thin layer or a thick layer? How thick was it? Yeah, the organic material that accumulated under the floating log mat was up to three feet in thickness huh. and over a wide area of the lake. There was not a, an area of the lake that didn't have a large quantity of plant material. And the primary plant material is sheets of tree bark. And it reminds me of the coal beds mm -hmm. that I was studying in Pennsylvania and in the eastern United States and Kentucky where abundant sheets of tree bark are found in the coal bed itself. So the, the plant material that accumulated in the bottom of this lake is very much in the texture and composition like the coal beds in the eastern United States. So what you're seeing here, does it look like we have the precursor to a coal bed right here? It, uh, this is the f uh, first step for the formation of a coal bed. Mm -hmm. We haven't completed the coal bed operation. We need another volcanic eruption to bury the bottom of the lake to make the plant material be compacted to form coal. But we have seen the first step for the formation of a coal bed. So let's suppose we had another volcanic activity here and we had a, what would it be, a mud flow? then that might come in and, and yeah. cover it? Yeah, or another uh, summit uh, avalanche deposit could yeah. very abruptly uh -huh. bury this. And, and uh, but, uh, or what was uh, down on the bottom of the lake in 1980 that was buried? Could that be coalified sitting down there already? Hmm. So, so do you think it can, uh, it can, that process can produce coal in that short of a time? I think it can. What we need is burial to squeeze out the water and then we need a little bit of heat. We don't need a lot of pressure to make coal, but in the laboratory we can make a coal, coaly like substance uh, very rapidly in weeks just by uh, compacting uh, the water away and then generating a little bit of heat. Mm -hmm. Internally, wood uh, generates heat when it's sitting away from oxygen, uh, the idea of the hay in the barn kind of thing. And so, uh, but yeah, oh, wood can be coalified and uh, that's, uh, uh, that, that's known from laboratory experiment. So all we need is uh, a, a peat layer, like we see formed right here, mm -hmm. another layer on top to provide the pressure, squeeze out the water, and we have coal. Yeah. Um, my PhD dissertation supervisor, the, my advisor, worked on the coalification of wood. Mm. And uh, it happens in weeks in the right pressure and temperature situations. It doesn't take millions of years to make coal. Just a little bit of, a little bit of heat and pressure uh, makes the thing happen. Mm -hmm. And coalification is one of the ways uh, that wood is preserved in the earth, fossilized, if you will. The other way, of course, is petrification, where mineral mm -hmm. infiltrates the wood. So, Steve, what caused you to have such interest in coal in the beginning? Um, as a kid... Uh, early age, I had lumps of coal, and I was always wondering how did the plant material get accumulated to make mm. the thick, uh, hard mass that's now coal? What was the process like that formed it? That, uh, uh, as a kid, I was very interested in that subject, mm. and I was looking at the glassy bands running through coal, realizing those are solid plant fragments in coal. What, uh, what was the story that a lump of coal has to tell? Mm -hmm. And what and, was the story you were told as a kid? Yeah, as a kid, they told me it took thousands and thousands of years to build up the thick, spongy plant material called peat, which was later compacted in a swamp, on a swamp environment, accumulated and compacted to make a layer of coal. Since the organic material in a swamp, a freshwater swamp, is antiseptic, it allows the 
the plants not to completely decay and, it, and you're able to build up this thick spongy layer of peat. I was told it took about a thousand years to form an inch of coal. That was the conventional explanation for the origin of coal. And I was out there at Penn State University in 1979 uh, to test that particular explanation for the origin of coal. And how did you test it? I uh, did the, the study of the Kentucky uh, coal bed mm -hmm. and uh, I pretty much disproved the swamp theory for the origin of coal. Well, in the, uh, in the explanation uh, and the process of going through a PhD thesis and dissertation, the university said, you can't turn in a thesis disproving a theory. You need to turn in a thesis proving a theory or generating a new theory for the origin of coal. So don't tell us what's wrong with the old theory for the formation of coal. Generate a new theory for the formation of coal. Well, the day before Christmas, uh, 1978, I was taking a bath, thinking about uh, the plant material, especially the tree bark accumulated in coal and the mm -hmm. thick layering in coal. And I was thinking about the root penetrated, very disorganized structure of modern swamp peats. As I thought about this, I was playing with soap suds and imagining logs floating on an ocean. And imagined an ocean full of logs, and these logs would rub against one another, and the bark would peel off and sink to the bottom. And that's what I call the floating mat model for the origin of a coal bed. What we see here essentially is the first step for the formation of a coal bed, like the coal beds in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And the modern swamp peats are intensely root penetrated and create this homogenous texture that's quite different than uh, the coal beds that we have in the, the world today. And those coal beds are better explained by this type of yeah. environment. So having studied what's going on here, um, what would you conclude now uh, and help people understand as to how the coal beds around the world might have formed? I was told that it takes thousands of years to form an individual coal bed and millions of years to form the, the strata with multiple coal beds. Instead, I think the coal beds and uh, the strata around the coal beds can form rapidly like in an ocean. And these logs could float around in an ocean with uh, marine organisms and the logs could uh, be peeled off, bark could fall to the bottom and uh, thick sequences of uh, plant material and uh, non-plant material like uh, uh, sand and lime sediment could be accumulated to make the, the, the coal layers that we see all over the world. Mm -hmm. And so this, the, uh, this log mat environment is a piece of a puzzle that helps us understand uh, the, uh, the rapid and catastrophic process to form coal and coal bearing strata. And I think this helps us understand the global flood of uh, Noah's day and even the catastrophic process that was going on on a colossal dimension. So this uh, provides for you a, a continual lab, doesn't it? Yeah, so this is a living laboratory for the study of coal formation. And Mount St. Helens just happened to make this laboratory for us to study. Uh -huh.